From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 164, recorded on January 10th, 2019. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. And remotely, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. And good afternoon, Daniel. <laughs> this is our inaugural episode of 2019. Yep. The first of perhaps 100 episodes this year, if we can do two a month. Let's hope. Let's only hope and only not hope. despair, as Dixon says. 100 wouldn't fit into a year if you only did two. 52 weeks. Oh, you're right. You're right. It's 50, It's 12 months. That's 24 episodes. Right. <laughs> that is significantly It's the fewer. other way. Just but that's fine. <laughs> Happy New Year to our listeners. And to uh, celebrate the new year, I have an email from Adil who writes, Dear Doctors, it was wonderful to have a new episode with which to end out the year. I know you would hardly go fishing for compliments. Sorry, I had to get in on the puns, too. But you certainly deserve them. Thank you for a wonderful year of podcasts. I am so glad I kept listening to NPR long enough to hear that segment, which referenced your show, <laughs> right. as I've been hooked ever since. I wish you the happiest of New Year's and look forward to a 2019 full of the best kind of earworms. <laughs> <laughs> earworms. What's the drug for earworms, Daniel? I think, don't you just burn those out? <laughs> <laughs> you listen to something else and get a new earworm. <laughs> it displaces the old earworm. <laughs> 2019 with 24 twips, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a nice little thing. 24 twips. In 24 weeks. <laughs> All right. Now let's jump right into our case from one. Yes. Six, three, Daniel. This will be good. All right. Um, I, I'm realizing that, uh, you know, people like the same thing. You know, we all grew up with things like Scooby-Doo. So I like to start this exactly the same every time or close there too. So for those of you tuning in for the first time or those of you tuning back in, I will either introduce or be reminding you of our case from the last TWIP. Uh, we saw a gentleman in his 40s. Um, and he was a gentleman. You know, we call everyone a gentleman. But this was a fine, fine young man. And uh, this fine young man, gentleman, <laughs> who came in uh, with a chief complaint of a problem with his nose that had been going on for two years. He relates this story that about two years prior, he had, he had uh, initially there was a headbutt from a friend. Later, there was a bonk to the nose with a surfboard. But he initially noticed a little bit of bleeding from the nose, some some scabs. And uh, he he tells us a little bit more about where his his background is. He was originally a New Yorker, actually, but he has spent much of his life um, going back twenty to thirty years ago in the southern eastern part of Costa Rica, not far from the Panamanian border. He owns a um, a surf shop, a bed and breakfast there. Uh, spends a lot of time there. He he tells us just as background as we go into this that 20 plus years prior to him developing this nose issue, he had an ulcer on his uh, on his hand. Uh, it was actually the edge was scraped, and they gave him a diagnosis. They said this is what you have. Uh, they then gave him 20 days of an injectable medicine. This then healed. So he thinks that might be. Rele relevant as we as we chat a little bit more uh his nose was getting worse and worse and so he had actually gone and seen an ent ear note ear nose and throat doctor here on long island um, they had looked into the nose and seen that um, the entire septum was destroyed there was a lot of destruction in inside the nose um, and they were recommending that he get nasal reconstruction they're Initial impression was that this was all due to trauma. Um, he was hesitant, came and saw me. We looked and saw that, yes, there was a lot of destruction to the septum. Actually, the whole nose seemed to be sort of collapsing. Um, the left nares was mostly closed. And he had a lesion. It started as a non-healing ulcer right at sort of the entrance to the left nares. And now over two years has progressed. Uh, and so we're going to leave people and 
And the couple of questions, how do we approach this? What are we thinking about? And uh, ultimately, how are we going to respond? All right. Dixon, would you be so kind as to read the first case guess? From- I would love to. So it says, Ivan writes, Dear Twip Legends, let me first tell you how great you are. <laughs> you sure you want me to read this? <laughs> so I picked you, Dixon. Okay. I discovered your Twix series podcasts about a year now. So far, I haven't had time to listen to all of them, uh, but enjoyed them very much every episode I have. I'm a second year resident of ECVP, European College of Veterinary Pathologists, at Zagreb at Department of Veterinary Pathology, Veterinary Faculty, University of Zagreb, Croatia. Currently, I'm doing a lot of studying because my board exam is just a bit one year ahead. Now, regarding the case, which really seems quite straightforward, the unlucky sufferer from Long Island had mucocutaneous leishmaniasis caused by L. brasiliensis. Based on the history presented, it is probably a smoldering infection acquired obviously at the beaches of Costa Rica, initially causing a cutaneous lesion described from a years ago that seemed to heal. My guess is, however, that the protozoan was not completely cleared and remained safe somewhere within the macrophages or dendritic cells and now causes the mucocutaneous form of the disease. It would be interesting to explore if the patient recalls any possible factors that would have led him to immunodeficiency compromised states lately. Perhaps described as a blow to the nose could also be contributing to that? I'm I'm adding a few words, but that's okay. But uh, it is more probable that the surfboard hit accidentally or accidental hit was actually a coincidence and that the lesions on the nose are already developing at the time of the accident. I guess it is also impossible to rule out the possibility that this mucocutaneous manifestation is actually a newly acquired infection independent of the first cutaneous manifestation since the individual continually spends significant time in Costa Rica. Unlucky surfer should not uh, undergo any kind of surgery for his nose before some serious treatment, probably with liposomal uh, amphotericin or any proposed medication in vet parasitology 6th ed. I'm a vet pathologist, so I don't really talk often about the therapy, especially not in humans. <laughs> even, with a, um, scru- hmm, even with a scrutinous... Scrutinous. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let's start again. <laughs> Even with a scrutinous therapy, there is a question if the leishmania protozoan will be cleared. Probably a negative result for leishmania after treatment is needed to proceed with to any nose job uh, surgery. Much as this case seems easy, I can't wait to hear yours and listeners' comments on this one. Thank you very much. Please don't cease your noble, educational, and amusing work on the podcasts. Uh, you forged a wonderful scientific podcast trio. That's very nice. All the best in 2019. P.S. Even though many parasites, like the one in today's case, affect both humans and animals, I would really appreciate hearing more about parasites affecting other mammals. For example, Sarcocystis, Neurona, Neurospora, Neurospora caninum, Spirocerca lupi, etc. It would be great if you would bring a veterinary parasitologist as a guest to the show once in a while. Ivan from Starry Skies, I got it. <laughs> That's a good riddler. Yeah, I should I should sort of remind people again. I think we mentioned this before. Our next edition, which we're very close to to getting out there, is we'll have a pronunciation guide. Yes, <laughs> we're, we're all very excited. Do you have the word scrutiny in there also? I hope <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to start adding. Uh... <laughs> hey, we 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 Daniel, we both struggle with names of things. I know we do. I think we complement each other nicely because the ones that you get wrong, I know, and the ones I get wrong, you know. So I think together, this is a good team. It's and actually, Vincent knows them all yeah. well. He knows them all. Yeah, it's actually uncanny, actually. But yeah, we seem to have. Uh, <laughs> I always enjoy my children who have gotten much of their vocabulary from reading to yes, hear how yes, they yes, pronounce things right, that they have right. never heard but have picked up sure, from reading. It's sure. entertaining. Yeah, Daniel. Uh, Yosef, our old friend Yosef is back. Dear TWIP team, I'm sorry I haven't been as active currently in residency at Northwell, mm-hmm. and it takes up a lot of time. Uh I guess I should give people background on this. So Yosef was, well, has been a listener of ours for a while. He went to the um, Hofstra Zucker School of Medicine, and uh, that 
school has a relationship with uh, one of the largest health systems in the country, Northwell, right? Indeed. And uh, he apparently now has gone from the medical school to the residency. That's so. wonderful. Uh, my guess for this case would be leash maniasis, given the history of cutaneous ulcers and now mucocutaneous involvement. P.S. I hope to see you around <laughs> in the hospital, Dr. Griffin. Nice. Sincerely, Yosef Davidoff. Very nice. Is, it, is there a chance that he might see you? Actually, tomorrow I will be at uh, North Shore and Long Island Jewish, two of the Northwell hospitals. I was at uh, Plainview today, but those two I'll be at tomorrow. Actually, I I might run across this. So when young you, trade. When you, when you say Northwell, so that could be several sites, is that right? Northwell now actually is a uh, health system with about 20 different hospitals. Really? So it's, it's become a bit of a behemoth. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so or, when, he when, he, when he says I might see you, you, you never know. It could be. Right? Well, the, res, their res, the Northwell residency is at the North Shore Manhasset Hospital and the Long Island Jewish Hospital. So, okay. yeah, I okay. uh, spend time at those hospitals. Do we know what kind of resident he's become? I don't know. He's got to let us know. <laughs> I'm hoping uh, in general internal medicine on his way to infectious disease and tropical medicine. There you go. There you go. Till writes, Dear Twipsters, while listening to Twip162 during my daily commute, I was overjoyed to find I had actually won a signed copy of PD6. <laughs> I was positively energized the rest of the day. Since you guys really inspired me to dig deeper into the wonderful world of worms and protozoans, I'm looking forward to receive a hard copy of your book for shipping. Please find my mail address below. I think if I remember, Till is from Germany. As for the case of TWIP163, this was an easy one for the regular listener, the man in his 40s from New York. It's likely suffering from mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, also known as espundia. It occurs only in the Americas from Mexico to Argentina, with the majority of cases occurring in Brazil. Although there are many leishmania species, only a few of them are responsible for most of the cases of MCL, namely L. brasiliensis and L. panamensis. The vectors are sandflies of different genera, Lutsumia in the Americas, Phlebotomus in Europe, Africa and Asia, it's typical for MCL to appear months or even many years after initial episode of cutaneous leishmaniasis. So this time frame would fit our patient's history, His lesion on hand 20 years ago. It's also typical for the lesion to first occur in the hyperemic frontal area of the nasal septum, and the first signs are often a congested nose and nose bleeding, epistaxis. <clears throat> if left untreated, the disease could quickly progress to the soft palate causing severe disfigurement, morbidity, and mortality, especially in poor or immunocompromised patients. Diagnosis ideally confirmed through direct proof of the pathogen in the lesion. Unlike cutaneous leishmaniasis, however, the pathogen can often not be found through direct microscopy from a tissue sample. In this case, PCR culture could establish the diagnosis. Treatment analogous to the visceral form should be initiated swiftly. In the setting described in New York City, this would most likely be with liposomal amphotericin B, 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram total dose spread out to at least five injections over 21 days. We typically give five doses over 21 days and apply the infusion slowly over one to three hours to prevent adverse events like hypotension. In other settings, i.e. India, single-dose infusions of five migs per kg have been tried with high reported success rates of over 90%. Patients should definitely refrain from the reconstructive surgery since the physical manipulation is believed to be able to reactivate any parasites left. I would ask to see the patient for checkup after 3 or 12 months to make sure the treatment was successful. Advice for prevention would be to restrain from sleeping out in the open on the beach and to have raised beds one meter over the ground, and finally, woven bed nets to prevent the sand flies from stinging. Lastly, I was a bit unsure about the need to move his surfing location, by which I understood a question of developing immunity. I know that patients develop immunity after self-healed cutaneous leishmaniasis, rendering them immune from at least the one leishmania strain that caused the initial infection. But after mucocutaneous infection that was treated, I would doubt that a lasting immunity could be assumed. Once again, thank you for your inspiring work. All the best, Till. Man, which is, which is uh, what you steer a, seal, a steer a sailboat with, the Till, right? <laughs> 
The tiller. <laughs> uh, I remember last time we had our, our, our program on it, I, I had read his letter and I said, till we meet again. And you thought that was a funny comment. And I thought, I didn't say that. It, I, I didn't realize that it had come out that way. So I repeated it today. Till. Didn't you take the till, uh, Dixon? Nope. No, so I, I, no, I but I'll gonna, take the Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna jump in and say that uh, you know I notice a lot of times we read through all these and then we sort of jump in at the end. We do. Uh, but one of the things I enjoyed the uh, the greater than one meter above the ground comment, um, <laughs> and uh, just thought I would I would make a mention. So I I, I believe here the the idea of. Uh, of a leishmaniasis and the one meter, this interesting idea that we, we think that the sand flies are very weak flyers. So if you're trying to avoid them and we say that sand flies in general can only get up to about 24 inches. So the Mm -hmm. one meter, interesting enough, puts you uh, say about about 30 inches. So you're about six inches above the, uh, the flight reach of a uh, sand fly. Exactly. Uh, and the only, the only sort of, I think, exception to this is this curiosity of the chiclero ulcer, where you have the people getting the bites yes. on the ears. Yes, that's right. And you sort of wonder, how do they get the bites? Do they sit down and get within that 24-inch range? I, I don't know if you have a thought on that. But um, but yeah, the greater than one meter above the ground, get yourself a little sure. bit higher than sure. the little sand flies can, can get. Right. Well, I think the chicle gra- uh, gatherers, which these people are, uh, often have to be on their hands and knees to see if there's any sap coming out of the bottom of the chickle trees. And I think maybe that's how they get exposed. Probably get below the 24 inches. Yeah, zone. they do. They do. And, and by the way, these um, sand flies are early morning and late evening biters. They don't usually bite during the daytime. So chickle gatherers, the ones that get out first to get that sap before everybody else, those are the ones that usually get the chicleros ulcers. Yes. Right. Cre- crepuscular. 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 Exactly. Crepuscular feeders. We had a wonderful lecturer here. Her name was Suzanne Holmes Giannini, and she was an expert on leishmaniasis, and she gave the lecture to the medical students for a while while we discussed this parasite, although we didn't always include it in our curriculum. And she was absolutely um, mesmerizing with her tales, and she, she did a lot of uh, wonderful research and, and talked a lot about these stories about how people actually come about them, and I, I loved listening to her. I, I miss her presence very much. I hope she's doing well wherever she is. She's at, it used to be at the University of Maryland. Um, Caitlin writes, Dear Twipsters, at long last, I write in another guess after missing the deadlines for the last two episodes, to my shame. In my defense, I was and still am busy moving across the continent. The unlucky sufferer, the unlucky surfer, had mucucutaneous leishmaniasis caused by one of the leishmania species in the Viana subgenus. Since he was probably infected in Costa Rica, my money is either on Brasiliensis or Panamensis. That's the Panamensis. This can be determined by PCR. He can be treated with paromomyosin or sodium stiboglucanite or, or <laughs> liposomal amphotericin B. Since leishmaniasis is spread by sandflies, not surfboards, the blow to the nose must have been coincidental and possibly lucky, as it might have caused the patient to seek treatment sooner than he might have otherwise. If my name comes up for the book, please spin again. The PDF is more portable and has the advantage of being control effable. No and cursing on the show. I, this is totally <laughs> above board. My keyboard is above board, and so is my language. Incidentally, I won the copy of Red Mother last time, I guessed, and I would highly recommend it to all parasite lovers. It's deliciously creepy. Could we perhaps have Dixon read a few of the poems out loud in a throwback to a very early twip? <laughs> I don't know. Could we? <laughs> ever, ever, ever a fan Caitlin, formerly of Waterloo, Canada, and now of Seattle. So Red Mother is by Laurel Redziski. We gave away all four copies. Laurel, I don't know if Laurel is listening, but um, Hmm. uh, people liked it, and people who didn't get it thought they would go buy it, so we hope you gave you a little bump. Yeah. And um, I will bring in, I I kept one copy, actually. You did, eh? Um, And... um, um, I will bring it in next time so you can read a few lines. If you'd like me to. Of that deliciously creepy book. 
I was going to I was going to comment about the control effable just for those mm-hmm. people that thought that that was somebody being rude. It's actually the control F is control find. It allows you to search for yeah. anything you want without having to flip back to an index. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so of course on a Mac it's command F. Well, it's okay. we're different. Uh, Daniel, can you take the next <laughs> one please? <laughs> We're all different. Some were different than others. That's right. Um, Surf and perf. Kevin writes, this is coming from Chicago, a surfer sans septum. (laughs) If you've lived through the 80s and have had any exposure to its voluptuary excesses, the absence of a septum immediately brings cocaine to mind. Uh Similarly, the stereotypes that dog the surfing community as being thrill-seeking hedonists might, in the more traditionally minded, bring up the great pretender, i.e. syphilis. Uh Perhaps you're older and epinemically inclined. You might be tempted (laughs) to use the discredited term Oh, Wagoner's granulomatosis, CN note. Okay, we'll mumble through that. We'll get back to that. Finally, (laughs) because the Paris parasitically minded often enjoy a gross out why not consider the lowly maggot dining on someone's nasal mucosa in conclusion preliminarily since brevity is the soul of twip apologies to shakespeare (laughs) as i've said before the vita is brevis i spill the beans and leave any digressions to the end notes (laughs) mucosal mucosal leishmaniasis what is grandly termed american Tegumentary leishmaniasis has several forms, cutaneous, mucocutaneous, and mucosal. The usual culprit is Leishmania brasiliensis, but other members of the Leishmania viana, viana species complex can be involved. Uh, mucosal involvement is also described in old world leishmaniasis, though the mucosal lesions are usually contiguous with a cutaneous sore. Our patient is suffering from what is generally regarded as the metastatic spread of a primary cutaneous lesion. Mucosal disease can occur nearly contemporaneously with the skin lesion or occur many years after a healed or improperly treated primary cutaneous sore. Approximately 3% of cutaneous leishmaniasis cases are complicated by mucosal disease. I think we'll comment on that later. Mm -hmm. The highest incidence occurs in Bolivia, where as many as 20% of leishmania infections result in mucosal involvement. The effect of mucosa in order of observed frequency is nose, pharynx, larynx, mouth. Mm -hmm. Pathogenesis is incompletely understood, but generally agreed to be due to a dysregulated immune response to the parasite. In a coincidental collision of TWIV and TWIP topics, <laughs> mucosal disease may be facilitated by infection of the Leishmania parasite with the double-stranded RNA virus LRV1 or Leishmania virus 1. Mm-hmm. And he references TWIV 128. I think you're involved with that, you guys, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. It has been mm-hmm. <laughs> observed <laughs> that uh, this virus infected Leishmania induce a greater chemokine cytokine response, which presumably augments the tissue destruction seen in mucocutaneous and mucosal Leishmania infections. Diagnosis, the patient should be tested for HIV since this is a risk factor for mucosal leishmaniasis. Strazula's review cites a case series of 100 co-infected HIV patients, 68% of whom had mucosal involvement. Wow. Syphilis testing is warranted due to the well-known but now very rare possibility of tertiary gumatous disease with tissue destruction of the nasal mucosa. Regarding definitive diagnosis of mucosal leishmaniasis, biopsy and histopathology is very low yield. Tissue culture and NAT and immunohistochemistry isoenzyme profiling have been attempted. PCR is currently regarded as the best diagnostic strategy. Treatment. Pharmacotherapy of mucosal leishmaniasis is complex. The CDC website and PD6 list many different medicines that are used, many of which are quite toxic and must be administered intravenously. In 2014, the FDA approved a 28-day course of oral medication for cutaneous mucosal and visceral leishmaniasis, miltefazine, or brand name, impavido. As PD Six states, this drug, this drug is expensive. Uh, he says here $16,712 for a 28-day supply. Actually, um, it's $57,000 right now. What? The price has increased. What? 
Uh, in summary, treatment must be individualized and is a rather specialized matter. Surgical planning, reconstruction, it is reasonable to assume that complete cure of the infection should be undertaken prior to any surgical adventures. My PubMed and general internet search for a systematic review of plastic surgical reconstruction in mucosal leishmaniasis was mm. unfulfilling. Mm. Surgery in these chronic patients is clearly a multidisciplinary affair mm. in order to achieve a durable and successful outcome. Right. Thanks to all you TWIT professors. Right. And then there's... Um, it's a bunch of end notes and references, yes, uh, which I think we will post. I want to just note a few of these, which are very yeah. interesting. Um, one paper here, a classic paper, uh, mm. has uh, the same Aspundia photo that appears in PD6. Marsden, it's by Marsden, yeah, is a good candidate for hero status in future podcasts. Yeah, yeah, Marsden. Philip Marsden is uh, a wonderful guy. Okay. And I, I should also, he gives us a nice differential, which I think is good. Wonderful difference. He, yeah. yeah. He talks with um, etiology of nasal sure, uh, sure, sure. Tra traumatic causes. That's right. Uh, he gives us a list of inflammatory infectious causes. Right. Um, he mentions neoplastic causes and then mentions, um, it says other, but these are a lot of toxic things like mm. uh, cocaine, renal failure, inhaling certain fumes. Yeah. Has a paper on the origin of Espundia, etymological <laughs> idol on the origins. The word is derived from the Latin spongia and Spanish esponja. The term was used as early as the 13th century to describe an exuberant cutaneous excrescence that affected horses. Wonderful. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, some uh, case reports without a septum. Here's, here's one uh, summary of... Um, Autoimmune-related nasal septum perforations. Over 140 cases, granulatomus, granulomatosis, 48%, polychondritis, 26%, cocaine-induced lesions, 15%. He doesn't mention nose rings or any metallic. He doesn't. He doesn't. But I would assume that sometimes you can botch that <laughs> procedure and get a bacterial infection that might erode the nasal septum. What do you think, Good. Daniel? So I've definitely seen infected um, nose rings and other body piercings in many places. Um, usually, yeah, usually you can treat it before it actually progresses. Mm -hmm. But no, that that mm -hmm. was, um, you know, I, I think it's nice to have a differential because, you know, some people might feel like, oh, this is such a compelling um, presentation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, sometimes, unfortunately, not like a, an acute bacterial, but some of our higher order organisms, like a certain type of mycobacteria, like a marinum or one of these others, can actually be introduced through those uh, procedures. And then it's mm. actually quite a disaster to try to treat this. It's not I'm something sure. you can I'm treat sure. just with antimicrobials, often requires um, surgery, et cetera. Yeah. We have some uh, information on my nasal myiasis. Yep. One of them, um, so he writes, some uh, rather unsettling photographs. The culprits were Chrysomia bidziana. In addition to ivermectin, the following was applied. Quote, a cotton bud impregnated with turpentine was placed in the right nostril for approximately 10 minutes, and 20 maggots were manually removed. The same procedure was repeated for two more days. Exclamation point added by Kevin. <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah. I must direct the readers to figure 38.12 in which there is a sarcophagia larvae in situ. Mm. Uh, but this gentleman was a homeless person and unfortunately also had a neoplasm of the navel septum. And these maggots were actually debriding the dead tissue. Is that what he's referred to here, the same picture as in this article? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to see the picture. To see. Well, he said that it is uh, the same photo. Oh. Oh, interesting. Well, that's, that's his patient. And this patient was uh, Bob Gwad's had access to that. He's one of uh, he's our medical entomologist on call, and um, yeah, it's disconcerting to see something like that. No question. Yeah, about they, it. he said one of these articles they call it a um, demoralizing condition. Yeah, uh, to have to have maggots in your nose. Yeah, yeah, but but the maggots aren't eating the tissue; well, they're eating dead tissue. All right, mostly that's true. I feel much better now. Yeah, <laughs> and in fact, that was the only approach in the Civil War to try to prevent gangrene from setting in in these wounds that they unfortunately had to deal with on a regular basis. 
Yeah, and as, as Dixon points out, the little qualification is that we used to think it was it was definitive. We used to say, oh, maggots only eat dead tissue, but we, we realized uh, they can get uh, a little bit true. exuberant. That's true. So, that's true. so you, you want to sort of let them eat the dead tissue, but you got to keep an eye on them because, yeah. you know, they'll go a little further sometimes. Yeah, Bob used to say that it depends on the species of maggot, but how the heck do you do that? <laughs> I'm not going to sit there and count the spiracles to make sure that which one I've got is the right one. So it's tough. Dave? No, no, even yeah, even with medical maggots, you, you <laughs> sort of keep an eye on them. Because, keep yeah. an eye. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But isn't it interesting how we've come full circle in some regards because drug resistance and all kinds of other therapies are no longer valid in some cases. And we're right back to where we started in terms of uh, folk medicine or traditional medicine, I should say. Mm-hmm. David writes, dear hosts, I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year. Like this week's patient, I spent my holiday break in beautiful, sunny Costa Rica, covering a mere 0.03% of the planet's landmass, but sustaining an incredible 5% of Earth's biodiversity. Exactly, exactly. I learned that Costa Rica is home to more species of butterfly than the whole continent of Africa. Yeah. While there, I was highly cognizant of the many parasitic species one could acquire if not careful and took precautions as to not end up as the next patient in one of Dr. Griffin's case studies. <laughs> as for this week's case guess, I believe the patient has developed a case of cutaneous leishmaniasis <laughs> caused by protozoans in the genus Leishmania. It is likely he contracted the parasites from sand flies on the beach in Costa Rica. It seems he had a previous exposure more than 20 years ago to something which gave him similar lesions on his hands, so... If he has been returning to the same surfing spot over the years, it's possible this beach is likely highly contaminated with parasite-ridden flies. Thank you for the informative and entertaining podcast. Sincerely, David P., who I'm pretty sure I met during my visit last December to Tufts Veterinary School. Oh, great. I had lunch with a collection of students and postdocs, and someone walked in with a twip mug. (laughs) Nice. A metal canister, one of those... (laughs) Big metal canisters. He said, Twip. I, he said, yeah, I'm a listener. I'm David P. Nice to <laughs> Nice. Very nice. Uh, I think that now you're yes, next, Dixon. Right? I am. Yeah. I am. Carrie writes, dear Twip Trio, in a parasitic context, a skin ulcer acquired in a tropical location immediately brings to mind cutaneous leishmaniasis caused by one of the many leishmania species transmitted by sand flies. And that other one with ulcers that I never remember. The combination with a lesion in the nose many years later uh, refines this to mucocutaneous leishmaniasis caused by one of the smaller subset of leishmania species. The fact that a parasitologist, upon seeing the nasal lesion, recognized it and deduced the existence of the past ulcer leaves little room for doubt in this diagnosis. PCR would provide a definitive test, although the diagnosis doesn't seem to have been in question. However, it could also confirm the species of Leishmania, which may have a bearing on the treatment options, although in this case it's already narrowed down considerably. Whether the patient is at risk of a mucosal recurrence is also not in question. For the sake of thoroughness, however, I consulted Parasitic Diseases, 6th edition, and found and ruled out Dracunculus metadensis or guinea worm, which can be found in Latin America but normally causes ulcers on the legs and feet, typically leading to multiple blisters and ulcers and doesn't, as far as I know, recur in the nose two decades later. One could certainly pick up cutaneous leishmaniasis in Costa Rica, but it is a little north of the so-called mucosal belt, Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru, where the beasties that cause mucocutaneous infection reside. The typical culprit in this location is L. panamensis, which only causes cutaneous disease. However, I was able to find reports of a study from 1998, the right approximate time frame, which isolated L. brasiliensis from two out of 34 leishmaniasis patients in Costa Rica. More um, commonly found further south, as its name suggests, Brasiliensis is one of the species responsible for mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, and I would put it forward as the most likely uh, offender in this case. The atypical infection for the location may possibly explain why the infection had recurred in spite of treatment at the time of infection, since some treatments for leishmaniasis are more or less effective against uh, different species of the parasites. It's possible that an inappropriate one was given on the assumption that this was a panamensis infection. 
Mucosal leishmaniasis and lesions are, will not normally heal on their own and left untreated can result in extensive tissue erosion with severe disfigurement and in the case of oral cavity lesions has the potential to lead to fatal infections of the lungs. Treatment would be systemic rather than local and quite an array of different drugs are available with different pros and cons. I will leave selection to the more qualified. I can't find any specific recommendations in the literature regarding reconstructive surgery and the treatment of a mucosal leishmaniasis. By the way, we should probably write a review article on that. Um, but in spite of a complete <laughs> lack of medical training, I will hazard common sense guess. I can't imagine any reason this chap shouldn't have his septum reconstructed, but I would think it should wait until after the ongoing infection has been dealt with. And of course, the surgeon should be appraised of the actual nature of the lesion. Thank you for another fascinating podcast from Carrie in Newcastle upon Tyne, England. And then she lists some references, or a reference, right. I should say. So, quick turnaround on TWIP this time. Fewer guesses, but that's good. Yes, that's true. Daniel. All right. Well, I'm going to give a little more information, <laughs> and then and then I'm going to have you two walk through this with me. So, we're going to, we're going to together, we're going to figure out how we manage this patient. So, as I mentioned, he was told that 26 years ago, uh, this ulcer that he had that was not healing at the time was due to a specific uh, pathogen. And uh, that was done. They had actually scraped the edge of the lesion and they had given them the diagnosis of leishmaniasis, cutaneous leishmaniasis. So right. this is 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Uh, they'd given him an in injectable for 20 days. This had then healed. So now he comes in presenting the way he, he does. So, um, you know, we, we have a lot of differentials here, so I won't make you go through it. So so what do we do at this point? Do we say, boy, this is compelling, and we just start the gentleman on uh, medication, or do we do any diagnostic testing? Um, I'm looking at Dixon because he's the only one that I can see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if I were the attending physician, I would certainly want a confirmation, and I would certainly recommend a PCR, um, which will give you the species. Okay, just so to, just to be sure, just one hundred percent. It doesn't take much time. It's I don't think it's a very expensive test, if I recall correctly. But I, I may be wrong on that. It's certainly not uh, sixteen thousand dollars a shot. And um, <laughs> as a result, I think we could afford to wait another day or two before we started treatment. We've already just, waited twenty years, right? Exactly right. <laughs> so. All right. No life so, yeah. threat. Yeah. So that's, so I, that's I will. So, it. so yeah. So I will, you know, one of the, the first thing we did, so we call up the CDC cause that's actually how you get the, uh, yeah. PCR done in, right. in the States. Right. I, I sort of at the time, you know, that he came into uh, my office, I, I was wishing I was down in uh, Lima where we would ah, have, yes. <laughs> we would have this answer in two hours. Sure. But, uh, so we, uh, reached out to the CDC, we contacted them, they sent us the kit. Um, we, uh, Five days later, we get the kit back. We do a scraping at the edge of the lesion. We send the material back off for both uh, leishmaniasis culture and uh, leishmaniasis PCR. Right. Okay. Right. And so now, now we're waiting again. You know, another five. So ten days have gone by now, and the uh, the PCR comes back negative, and the culture, you know, does not grow anything. Mm. Really. Yeah. So what are, what are we doing now? Hmm, is right. <laughs> well, then, uh, maybe we took the scraping from the wrong part. That's number one. Maybe we should do it again just to make sure we got it right. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. I was going to suggest, I was going to tell you what the, what the culture medium was. It's called Schneider's medium. It's an insect tissue culture medium, mm -hmm. and it imitates the stages that live in the sandfly rather than in the human. Um, nothing grew. That's interesting because even one infected macrophage with a nest of uh, amastigotes would probably give rise to the positivity of the culture. Got nothing. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to look at the scraping. You could look at it microscopically. Uh, you, you could do some histochemistry. Well, you could see these little dots and dashes, as we call them. Morse code. Uh, Morse code, basically, with a dash and a dot underneath it, which represents the uh, the. Um, Kinetoplast. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> filling in that missing <laughs> blank. Right. I was going to say the extra nuclear source of DNA in the organism, which is true too. Yeah, um, I knew everything with the name of the organelle, right? Uh, so I, gee whiz, gee whiz, Daniel, what did you do? Wait, wait, okay. let me just wait, 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 Vince. Yeah, yeah, the problem is the problem is that 
the drug is fifty thousand dollars, so we can't just start treating. Well, we're going to use that drug. Another oh, one. I'm not sure. Yeah, so, which, yeah, you so use that, that is, drug. <laughs> so that is interesting. Yeah, if you say, oh, you know, we'll just start this. Um, mm. If you were to try to to prescribe that drug, yeah, fifty seven thousand dollars. Sure, you're not you're not going to have a little trouble getting that. All right. Incredible. Uh, yeah. So, so the, yeah, so what, what do we do at this point? So, it, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. So while this period of time is going on, I actually admit to the, I admit the patient to the hospital. Um, I put the patient on ambisome. That's a liposomal form of amphotericin. Okay. And we actually, and we actually see by 72 hours, the nose looks quite a bit better. Huh. Okay. So the nose looks quite a bit better, uh, but now here we are. We we commit to treatment. I commit to a treatment of twenty days with the amazone. The nose looks improved, but not as good as I would like it to be. Mm-hmm. And we have our mm-hmm. negative scraping, and we have our negative culture. So at this point, I send the gentleman for actually not just the scraping, but for a a biopsy. Now, I actually, send him to a, a different ENT. Sure into the nose, takes a nice biopsy at the edge of the septal perforation. This is uh-huh. this um, granular um, tissue. And again, we send it for the different cultures, uh, different PCR testing. And um, now we've got a good bit of tissue for pathology. Right. Okay. So now then. With so, maybe- Daniel, you kept him in the hospital for 21 days while you did this treatment? No. Actually, what I did is I, uh, I put in one of these um, – pick line. So it's a it's an IV that can stay in. And then just once a day, he's getting his medicine at home so he can go ahead and get the treatment. And actually, cool. the ambisome is all covered by his um, insurance. So, And what does that drug cost, just in kind of curiosity? <laughs> yeah, to him, nothing. <laughs> right, right, right. But certainly a lot less than the other yeah, uh, exactly. boutique mm-hmm. drugs, so to speak. Yep. Okay, so I'm sorry, uh, Vincent, you had some comments. Yeah, I asked, yeah, I asked him about... Um, what, didn't I ask him already? <laughs> what did you ask? You're out of questions? <laughs> that doesn't sound right. <laughs> no. So I asked him if he were in the hospital for 21 days, but he said right. no. no, no. He did home okay. treatment. Okay. All right. So, so you don't, you're not happy. So you took this new biopsy, and then you're asking us what happened to that. Yeah. So that yeah. was PCR positive and culture positive. Seems that way. And yeah. the tissue was... You can see the organisms in the tissue section. Yes. So no. So that was so that was negative as well. <laughs> really? <laughs> so and all what, three of them. Oh, boy. <laughs> and what the pathology actually revealed was a squamous cell cancer. <sighs> oh my yeah. gosh! Oh my yeah. gosh! Oh my! But gosh. why did it improve with the amphotericin? So that, that's I'm not sure about actually, and I have to say there's there's two issues here. First is the sensitivity of the oh, PCR and the culture, and and I really kind of you know went through the literature again you know after after this experience. And um, when you're at a place that does it all the time, you sometimes see you know, reasonable seventy percent mm-hmm. sensitivity. Um, but actually, if you kind of go through, sometimes the sensitivity is low as 40%. And remember, this is, you know, you're sending it off to the CDC. Right. This is not a large volume process. That's right. Uh, so so one, one issue is, is, was the sensitivity such that it was really there when we started treatment and, and we just didn't pick it up? Um, and I, I think the same with culture, mm. too. It, it's actually the culture, I would feel comfortable saying, only about 50% sensitive, even when I talk to the people in Lima who do this on a regular basis mm-hmm. so um, mm-hmm. I've seen where you see the nice dotted dash on the scraping yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but then you just the culture just doesn't grow it up so it's not it's not a slam dunk like some it other was. things mm. so the way I put this together is I do like the idea that this was a mucocutaneous leishmaniasis but the other and I think this is sort of hopefully the, the point here is there was something else going on because the person the person improved it was pretty good improvement but it was not as good as I had mm. seen in previous cases wow. and that was why we went and said we we need to make sure there isn't a second thing going on which I think the squamous cell uh, may have been a second thing as described this has been two years of going on I don't think a squamous cell cancer is going to go on for the full two years but there are a lot of um, cases of squamous cell cancers developing at the edge of leishmaniasis cases. Mm-hmm. No, nope. and I and I wow. think that may have been what wow. we uh, what mm-hmm. we ran into here. So, so, fortunately, this gentleman is now seeing um, an ENT. is going to have removal of the residual um, mm-hmm. squamous cell cancer, and then at some point, reconstruction of the nose. Good lord! So the cancer was secondary to the cutaneous. 
leishmaniasis. That that's my impression, and we you know we have pathology confirmation that there was squamous cell cancer. We had yeah, a yeah. pretty nice but not complete response to treatment, mm-hmm. and that was what raised for me the possibility that hey, uh, there's something mm-hmm. else going on, which apparently sure. there was when we got the pathology. So are there other reports of this? Uh, you, you mentioned that this has been seen previously. Is it not frequent, rare? What is it? Um, I, I would say uncommon. And okay. most of the descriptions out there are um, people with the chronic untreated uh, cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, and then the squamous cell cancer develops mm-hmm. at the edge of that untreated lesion. So the other parasite that I think of when I think of squamous cell epithelioma is um, schistosoma hematobium in the bladder of the ca- of the, uh, of the bladder cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get lesions at the base of the uh, the bladder because the the urine tends to to remain there, and the offending carcinogens, um, together with the presence of the parasite, it has to be like in, near an industrial area, usually are around African industrial areas, where you find the coincident of uh, of uh, schistosoma hematobium. And bladder cancer. It, it doesn't always give you bladder cancer. So we think there's a co-carcinogen there someplace. But so what about the chances for metastasis of this uh, nasal septum epithelioma? Yeah, so fortunately, and I, I talked to the ENT, uh, it looks like this is going to be localized. It looks like this will be a curative resection, um, which again goes against the idea that this has been for two years. Right, right? two years right, would have. Right, 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 right. You, you would think, boy, two years of an untreated cancer. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, so. Because with the bladder cancer, of course, it does spread and it does metastasize to lots of other areas. And that, that's really the reason why patients usually die from this uh, infection. So the yeah. treatment is simply. Um, excision in this case. There's no chemotherapy, right? Yeah, for the squamous, it's going to be excision um, of the tissue. And often they'll actually be doing this where they're looking under the microscope, some sort of a, a mose type procedure where they're taking small sections, making sure they mm-hmm. only resect as much as they need to because you don't want to overdo it, but you don't want to leave stuff behind. Right. Um, and then sort of, you know, initially wearing a, a, a fake nose, a prosthetic nose for a while, and then going later for a reconstruction. Got it. Mm. All right. Interesting. So wow. Yeah. So it's sort of an iatrogenic aspondia. <laughs> <laughs> because I think aspondia is only applied to that very severe form of erosion of the soft palate, as I recall. What do you, is that something that I've picked up by a ra- random rumor or is that, uh, does it, you know, does that resonate with you also, Daniel? I guess it depends. It depends. I don't know if I think of aspondia as, as, as technical word as it, it might be right. It, it, it really, the mucocutaneous um, leishmaniasis, which often untreated can be quite severe. Yes. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting in our emailer who wrote it and talked about afflicted horses because I don't oh, know if yeah. I share, shared this with people on um, TWIP, but one of the islands, um, areas that we go to in Panama, really high incidence of uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. And I was hanging out one evening uh, with a bunch of the the floating doctors. And uh, they showed me, oh, look at this wonderful dog that we always see when we go there. And I was like, wait a second. Let's, and the dog had this nice, nice, we'll call it cutaneous leishmaniasis lesion on its snout. Right. And so <laughs> I sort of thought like, why don't we treat this dog? And then maybe that will reduce the amount of sure. in this area. So. Exactly. Exactly. Why did you call it iatrogenic, Dixon? Because they were causing it to occur because they actually removed a portion of the tissue and caused the nose to disappear, basically. Oh, okay, but... Oh, God. I, I, I thought you meant the case. No, it was, the case. no, no, not the case. It no. was, a, no, it was no. just... A, All right, got it. Yeah, and I think also I liked in the... Just to give more homage to the differential, it's great, great to have a differential, right? As we see yes. in this case, because you think just, that's oh, right. that's it, treated them. Well, I did treat you. You should get better. Go away, because you're right. not following the rules. Exactly. It's good to think about these other things, and syphilis was brought up. We're right now in the middle of, I'll say, a syphilis epidemic. Yeah. Um, I saw a young man um, actually earlier today with a syphilitic guba in his rectum. Really? So we are. Uh, it's important to think about these different um, diseases, even when something as you know, as in this case, is just so compelling uh, to think about. What's the differential? Yep. What else could it be? Yep. Um, and do the diagnostic testing as we did to to figure out what exactly is going on. Sure. All right. Let's give away a book. Hey. 
Now, we only have three entries here because all the others already got a book. <laughs> and I've eliminated them. So that leaves three people who are in the contest. And the, those three people are, so Ivan, as far as I know, in Zagreb didn't, didn't win a book. Tilt got a book. Kevin got a book. <laughs> um, and I've included, I think David P. might have, but I'm, gonna, I'm not sure, so I'm going to include him uh, anyway. So that's two and carry, three people. <laughs> so wow. let's see, out of the three, you have a good shot. We have winning. a well-read audience. <laughs> Here we go. Generating a number between one and three. It's number three. It's Carrie. Okay. Carrie, you won. Now, Carrie um, uh, is in Europe also. Yeah. Newcastle upon Tyne. Yes, that's not Europe. It's, <sighs> it's England. <laughs> it's over there. <laughs> it's Brexit. Come on. It's not Europe. <laughs> they haven't done it yet, right? It's over there. No, but they're gone. The European Union, I should say. Right? Yeah, that's right. They're still in it. Britain never thought of themselves as being part of Europe. Yeah, I know. People say that yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm going to Europe. Hey, where you are you flying eh? to? I'm going to London. <laughs> right, right. No, no, I understand. Anyway, Carrie, send me your address. I also need your phone for an international shipment. That's all it's needed for. I have to put it on the form. And now we have a paper, which is something a little bit different. A little bit different. But we need to do th different things. And this is it. This is an MBio paper, which is open access, so you can go check it out. A tale of three species, adaptation of Sodalis glossinidius to tsetse biology, Wigglesworthia metabolism, and host diet. Wow. Now, this is <laughs> peripherally about uh, African trypanosomiasis caused by trypanosoma brucei, the vector, the tsetse fly glossinia. Yes. And the microbiome of glossinia, which is important for the parasitic disease. Now, this fly, can I call it a fly, Dixon? You may. It's a dipterin. The tsetse fly it's a has a limited bacterial microbiome. It consists of a primary obligate symbiont, Wigglesworthia glossinidia, and typically a secondary facultative symbiont, Sodalis glossinidius. So the Wigglesworthia has to be there. Yes. And the Sodalis is sometimes there. Right. Now, Sodalis glossinidius, its presence correlates with the ability of the CT to be infected by Trypanosoma brucei. That's remarkable. Isn't that remarkable? It is remarkable. So, so Sodalis um, is an um, interesting bacterium. Um, it has uh, a lot of pseudogenes, over 1,500 pseudogenes. Its genome is pretty large, 4.17 million bases. And they say this is consistent with it making a rapid and recent movement from free living to a host-restricted niche. So there are many bacteria that are symbionts, obligate symbionts, and often intracellular or endosymbionts like Wolbachia. They live within the cells of another organism. And that living often is accompanied by genome reduction. You lose all the genes for stuff you don't need because you get it from the host. And Wolbach has a very small genome. But this is pretty big, and that's why they say it may be recent. So maybe it's in the process of becoming a fully obligate symbiont, but it's not quite there yet. And they say symbiotic bacteria often present with small degraded genomes. This paper focuses on Sodalis glossinidius, not Wigglesworthia. Um, unfortunately, Wigglesworthia is interesting in, in, <laughs> in its own right because there uh, was a scientist named V.B. Wigglesworth. <laughs> no, very uh, famous. Very what was famous he? What man. was his profession? He was an entomologist <clears throat> and an invertebrate zoologist is a better way to, to say it. So if it's, I may take a, a slight diversion here, just a few minutes. It's our poetry section. <laughs> uh, John Uptake wrote a poem about V.B. Wigglesworth, after whom Wigglesworthia glossinidia is named. And it's called V.B. Nimble, V.B. Quick. V.B. Wigglesworth wakes at noon, washes, shaves, and very soon is in the lab. He reads his mail, swings a tadpole by the tail, undoes his coat, removes his hat, dips a spider in a vat of alkaline, phones the press, tells them he is FRS. 
subdivides six protocells, kills a rat by ringing bells, writes a treatise, edits two symposia on will man do, gives a lecture, audits three, has the sperm club in for tea, pensions off an aging spore, cracks a test tube, takes some pure science and applies it, finds his hat, adjusts it, pulls the blinds, instructs the jellyfish to spawn, and by one o'clock is gone. <laughs> Told on an, all in the course of an hour, he's done It's very this. productive one hour. <laughs> he wakes at noon and very soon is at the lab. Isn't it remarkable? That's great. I love how, that poem. <laughs> I do too. And I love the name because when you think of all the things that he's worked on, a lot of them do wiggle. And he got a lot of worth out of studying them. I've, I've read this yes. from a yellowed, crumbling piece of paper that was stuck on the bulletin board of my first lab here at Columbia. When I arrived in 1982, the lab was empty. Someone had been in before. And this was the only thing on the wall, this poem. I think it was in the office, but I don't remember. And I saved it ever since, and it's crumbling and yellow. I'll scan it for you, and we'll post but it on the news. I love it. It's I good. just love this it's poem. Good. And I've quoted it over the years from time to time. And only recently did I realize he had a bacterium and a symbiont of Trypo Trypanosoma brucei. What a convergence of coincidence, right? Correct. Because if I hadn't started TWIP, I would have never known about <laughs> Wigglesworthia glossinidia. Yeah. All right, back to Sodalis glossinidius, which is the, you know, maybe sometime symbiont, but its presence is absolutely important for... Crucial. Crucial for T. brucei infection. We'll get a clue about why that might be here in yeah, this paper, yeah. but we actually don't know the answer. Now, the problem with, with these people want to study S. glossinidius, but it won't grow in culture. And this, the, the goal of this work is to define a, cro, a growth medium that S. glossinidius will propagate in, because it doesn't grow in LB, which we all use to grow E. coli, for example. It's a rich medium, but it doesn't grow in it. It needs something else. They'd like to be able to grow it so they could, say, modify it and put it back into the tsetse fly and ask what's needed for T. brucei infection, right? That would be cool. So that's what they do here. And the approach is really neat because they have a related um, bacterium, Sodalis precaptivus, which is a free-living bacterium, and it can grow in culture. It's highly related to S. glossinius. And Dixon said to me today, where did this come from, <laughs> this S. precaptivus? Right. And I looked it up, and it was isolated from the wound of a 71-year-old's hand. He had punctured his hand with a dead crabapple stick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he got an infection <laughs> and they cultured S. precaptivus out of it. And that was the first time it had been cultured. So they say it's an, it's an environmental bacterium. It's free living. Okay. It's, it's a hippie. <laughs> it's a joke. Nobody got it, I guess. So th this genome has been sequenced and they compare it to S. glossinidia and they say, what metabolic genes differ and could we use that as a clue? Because S. precaptivus will grow in culture and S. glossinidius will not, right? Correct. So the paper is a mixture of bioinformatics where they, they construct metabolic pathways depending on what genes are present in these two organisms. And then they say, okay, S. glossinidius grows at this rate. If we take out these genes, how slowly will S. Um, S or meta metabolites or genes? Metabolism genes, Yep. Right. Genes of metabolic pathways, you know, because exactly. there are other genes of obviously for other th structural elements and so forth. But they're just interested in the metabolism because that will give them clues about how to get a, a, a medium constructed to get this to grow in. That's yeah. It. What was the first organism's genome ever sequenced? Organism, not, not virus. I think it was a Haemophilus. You're right. By Craig Venter. You're right. But the next one, <laughs> Wait, you e. Went the coli. Second one. Well, e. coli. And E. coli is a, a symbiont of our gut tract. Well, it's, yeah, but it's not an obligate symbiont because it will grow. No, no. Wait a minute. Where else does it grow? It grows in gut tracts. You're right. It's not an environmental bacteria. Nope. But, but it will grow in culture. It's a, but it's, a, it's part of our normal microbiome. 
It's not. It's not highly reduced, right? <laughs> and that's you know, were there 3,200 or 3,800 genes, something like that, compared to this mm-hmm. organism? How how many species of Sol Dallas are there? I mean, you're asking these general questions first, just to so Dallas to tease the audience into thinking about how big of a spectrum are we talking about for this this genera. A genus, I should say, this genus. I don't know how big it is. Because when you were talking just now, mm. and Daniel was saying, ah, oh, but these are metabolic genes. These are genes that regulate metabolism, basic, yeah. uh, you know, energy metabolism. I th- I envisioned um, a scientist sitting in a, an empty laboratory. There are no test tubes. There are no benches. There are no seats. And he's pointing, or she's pointing into the air and springing into vision are these holograms of metabolic pathways and their interrelatedness. And you can put your finger on one and point to it and eliminate something and see what else comes in. We're almost at that point of having that kind of data, aren't we? That you can create these large, gigantic data sets and manipulate them in cyberspace to yield results that really relate to the real world and that's that's basically what this yeah, so this is. is that's exactly right they've taken the <clears throat> genes encoding metabolic components of metabolic pathways like the krebs cycle right? right and they have asked we we have this bacterium you know pre captiva that grows and if we take away this gene, how slowly is it going to grow? So they yeah. computationally model it. And these are actually computationally model. They, they give <laughs> names to these uh, metabolic data sets. Right. Actually, there's one that was already proposed. It's called IEB4458. Okay. And <laughs> then they make their own. And actually, I'm not going to go through the data. What I want to do is say the experimental part is a mixture of them manipulating the metabolic gene sets right. computationally and asking what's the outcome right. and actually doing experiments to say, okay, can we you have to confirm it? To, can we confirm this? You know, and they, right. they start with a medium. They, they have a pretty minimal medium and it doesn't grow. And then they start adding back yeah. things, which yeah. is informed yeah. by the difference between these two genomes. Right. So I, I don't mean so, to, so it's a very up. simple paper in the sense that they do computational analysis and then they simply grow the bacteria in broth and measure the optical density. So we're now at the (laughs) stage of where physics was many years ago where you had two groups of physicists, right? We had experimental physicists and we had theoretical physicists. And neither, never, never the twain shall meet. They they didn't talk to each other. They didn't, they read each other's papers a little bit. But look at where we've advanced to that stage. Now we have the hydrogen super collider. We've thinking about you know doing all kinds of other big time experiments with lots of people's money. And now you've got biologists that are doing exactly the same thing. You've got a theoretical biology group. You've got a, an experimental. You've got the same group now in both places, mm-hmm. and they can do everything by simply analyzing something in cyberspace and then taking that and putting it into sure, the lab sure. and saying, is it real or not? Well, Dixon, that's the goal here. This is you magnificent. Know, this, the goal of computational biology is in part it's to eliminate wet experiments one day. You know, you still need to confirm something. Well, maybe. Like this one. But they, their argument is if our database is sufficiently large, of course, we can predict anything. And the way it's happening now on a lower level, besides what, sh- what we're doing here— this has been going on for structural biology for some years. Can we look at the sequence of a protein and completely predict its three-dimensional structure? Right. So right now we don't have enough structures to do no, that. But once your database is sufficiently large, you could do it. Correct. And here, the same idea. Can we look at all the genes encoding metabolic uh, enzymes and transporters and so forth and predict how this is going to grow? And if we take away individual genes, yes. Right. And you're right. Biology is headed this way. We people want to put down the pipettes and sit at a computer and do these experiments, and it would be a lot cheaper, wouldn't it? Yeah, but you still need. You could confirm it, but it would still be cheaper and fair. quicker. Yeah. than the way we do it That's today. Fair. If there's time, I'd like to come back to this concept. There will be time because I'm going to now tell you the summary <laughs> of these experiments. Oh, good. So they def- <laughs> they defined a growth medium. They call it SGM. 11, Soldatus glycinia medium number 11. <laughs> right. It supports growth, right. which is the first time this has ever been done. 
And there are two key components. They started with M9 medium, and uh, it has the M9 has quite a bit in it, but they added a carbon source, N-acetylglucosamine, which is a sugar, and this is lacking in the blood meal taken Perfect. by the fly. Exactly. It's not in the blood meal. So where does Glossinia uh, get N-acetylglucosamine, right? It's got to have it in the fly. Well, they think it gets it from the peritrophic matrix. Peritrophic matrix is, is a covering of the gut intestinal cells, all right? That's, that's right. And they think, and this, uh, this is chitinous, it's a protective barrier, and they think that digestion of this chitinous matrix will provide the n glucosamine that S. glossinidius needs to survive in the gut of the fly. Right. And in turn, it allows the CC, what's the form of the trypanosome that's? Promast. The promastigote to cross this matrix into the underlying tissue so that it can eventually spread to the salivary glands. So the destruction of the membrane providing n glucosamine for the bacteria to grow allows its, the T. brucei to persist. That's their hypothesis. That Isn't that is, cool? It's amazing. Now, who digests this chitin? is not known, but they could figure this out at some point. But again, n glucosamine is not in the blood meal. Nope. So somehow it has to come from the tsetse fly. Otherwise, this bacteria wouldn't grow. Yep. So the, the bacteria is helping T. brucei. Sure. Maybe inadvertently. I don't well, know. Wigglesworth yeah, must be doing something too. <laughs> so Wigglesworth is doing the other part. So the other part of this is that they found that it needs thiamine. It cannot make its own thiamine. Thiamine. Right? It yes. needs... It needs to have it provided. Monophosphate, as we saw. Yeah, it's yes. provided as a monophosphate form, and they think the symbiont Wigglesworthia glossinidia provides thiamine to um, S. glossinidias, but they're not sure. So what a, what a, it's a three, as the title says. That's right. A tale of three species. A troika. A troika. <laughs> you got the sodalis, you got Wigglesworthia, and you have, I guess, the the uh, tsetse fly is the other species, right? Or sure. is it the trypanosome? I mean, trypanosome is not giving anything to anyone. There are, there are four. It's a involved. parasite. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, the tsetse fly is an ectoparasite in the sense that it's a blood feeder, right? So it, it solely lives on blood. Mm-hmm. So you can consider mosquitoes that way or fleas or ticks. Yeah, they're ectoparasites. They're ectoparasites. So, the, so you've got parasites and parasites and parasites. But this... This T. brucei is the ultimate because it gives yeah, nothing to this trio. It's not, taking. Not a damn thing. It's so selfish. Reminds me of some other people in this world. <laughs> so they would like to, they, their last sentence is wonderful, by comparing uh, the dispensable redundant genes to those in both free living and symbiotic bacteria, it is possible to assess the trajectory of the symbiosis. So they'd like to know how the symbiosis arose. Right. And they can compare the bacteria that are symbiotic versus not free living and hope to do that. Exactly. So that's why I thought this paper was cool. No, it's marvelous. And it, it evoked a lot of old um, memories of learning about the biology of setsy flies. And we had a discussion briefly today. Uh, we, we've been conversant <laughs> on, the, on the level of now what, what, what does this mean for the both forms of African trypanosomiasis, right? You've got T. rhodesiense and T. gambiense. They're carried by different species of, of uh, glossina, and they live in different mm-hmm. places. If you live in East Africa, the glossina lives in a population density of one setsi fly per square mile. <laughs> <laughs> one per square mile. But at the same time, it can infect the, the the trypanosome can infect all of the game animals mm-hmm. in East Africa, including people. We're not game animals, but certainly it infects domestic cattle, humans, game animals, almost any hoofed mammal, and, and, and us included into the primate groups. On the other hand, um, the West African trypanosomiasis infects maybe two or three different species, a pig, perhaps, Mm -hmm. humans for sure. And there are millions of glossina along the rivers of West Africa. That's where they breed and that's where they stay. So the difference between West and East African glossina 
are huge. And now I wonder whether or not these symbionts are found in the East Africa and West African forms as well, because I don't know where this one came from either, but we were talking about the biology of glycine. Mm. Okay. So they're very caring, loving mothers. They give rise to an egg Mm -hmm. and the egg hatches within the body of the female and develops as a larva by feeding on certain specialized tissues mm-hmm. inside the glycina. Mm-hmm. And at the last moment, as the larva matures, she seeks a, a, a place to lay the larva, not the egg. She lays a live larva, a mature, fully mature larva, at the base of a tree, like an acacia tree, something like mm-hmm. that. Now, And then very quickly after that, the larva pupates and then hatches as an adult fly. So... Maybe that's where Soldalis comes from, that, that transition between the larva and the pupa. Right at that moment of being deposited on the ground, that's, maybe that's where it picks up the symbiote. And, and maybe some are in some trees and some are not in other trees. You said, what was the source of this? A crab apple, a branch of a crab apple tree, right? For the free living form, at least. So you think that maybe this was also, a, maybe this is a, a normal inhabitant of, well, there's lots of kinds of thorn bushes and, and, and stuff like this in East Africa as well. West Africa, probably not. I just looked up how many species of trees there are in the world. You want to try to guess? Uh, 650,000. <laughs> no, that's, that's a bit of an overkill. There are 60,000 species of trees, about. That's still a lot of tree species, right? Mm-hmm. So it what if, if this is a uh, symbiont, if we can use that word for the tree— I don't know. Maybe it's found in only certain kinds of species of trees. Who knows what? It 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 it, it allows your mind to wander off into the larger fields of ecology in relationship biology, which is mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but parasitology is a small branch of, of but uh, no pun intended. So I was going to come back to something else. Actually, I got wrapped up in a series of television shows last night. The first one was with uh, David Attenborough, a special on uh, ichthyosaurs, which was great to watch. And that, I'm not going to mention that. There were no parasitisms involved. But the, <laughs> the second one really grabbed my attention. I don't know if, Daniel, did you by any chance get a chance to flip that on? By any, It was a Nova. So, so remember, I don't have, t- I don't have uh, uh, you, you TV. Can, you can stream this on your computer. Like it, you got it. Then you got to tell me. <laughs> you can stream it on your computer. And this was... A rehash and a bringing up to date of quantum mechanics as seen through the eyes of Albert Einstein. Neither, it's not parasitic either, is it? No, but it certainly <laughs> did change my view of the way the real world works because I haven't been paying attention to that literature. Who the hell can read it? I, I certainly can't. <laughs> but they made it understandable. And, and the thing that they made understandable was the power of calculations, and then experimental validation. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you have here. You have a paper where you have calculations, you have big data sets, and now you've got validation of the... Exactly right. And and by the way, do we have a little bit of moment to to go into what that experiment was that they did that validated the quantum entanglement aspect? Because they're basing computers on this stuff now, and they're building machines that are driven by this theory of quantum mechanics, which is now, I think, been proven. Okay. So if Einstein had lived long enough, he would Mm -hmm. have seen this come to fruition. And what they used was the fact that when you excite um, a pair of electrons off of a calcium ion, they they leave as pairs. And uh, they're, they're identical in every single way. And what affects one affects the other one at the same time, no matter where they are. You can move them from one edge of space to the next, and they will still influence each other. That's what quantum mechanics says, mm-hmm. and that's not just counterintuitive. That's like, come on, you must, you're you you're kidding around here, right? You want to build a wall where? <laughs> that sort of thing. This, this program said, here's how we proved that. Mm-hmm. They used the calcium, uh, uh, the uh, electrons from the calcium, they turn them into photons, and that's what happens to them. When they leave, they turn into photons. And they can then be detected by a photon detector. 
and they they go in opposite directions. Don't ask me how they got them to do that, but that's that that's their worry, not mine. But this the setup was to have a central facility where they generated these pairs of calcium photons, and they directed each of the set of pairs into a separate observatory in the Canary Islands. Each one was focused on a separate quasar. Mm-hmm. The quasars were emitting light at a variable frequencies, okay, because they have these, they, they spin rapidly and they emit huge amounts of radiation. And they, it's random. <clears throat> they, they fluctuate between two random things like this. And so they set the slits to accept the photons based on the randomness of the light that was received from each of these quasars. Now, that means that there's no way that you can synchronize this if you decided to say, well, yeah, it's your filters that's giving you the result. The result that they were looking for was whether or not both photons went through the filters at the same time, regardless of the filter. And if that was true, <laughs> then this the, the quantum entanglement mm-hmm. hypothesis becomes fact. And this was a kid's, a kid's, I'll say a kid, he was in his 20s. He was doing this as his PhD thesis <laughs> at the University of Vienna. And he, he commandeered two very large telescopes plus this experiment that was going on in the central building. And the, the weather didn't permit it to occur for two separate times. And then finally, they conducted the experiment and they got a result two months later after the calculations were made, that absolutely confirms the theoretical expectations from the calculations for what entanglement actually is. Hmm. And I was stunned at how clear, okay, this was a clarity of explanation because (laughs) there's no way to explain quantum mechanics to somebody off the street, but they did it. They showed you how they did it. And they said, this is a this is a conundrum. We don't understand how this works. We're going to try to find out. Here was the setup. It's very simple, but very difficult at the same time to actually ensure that nothing else is going on. And that's the problem. There could be lots of different things going on. And they, they hearkened back to a meeting that was held in, uh, I think it was in Germany, but I'm not sure. Uh, no, it was England, I, I think. Uh, now, again, I'm blocking on this, but this program is uh, downloadable. You can actually watch it. A group of very prominent physicists, they said that half of them went on to win Nobel Prizes, gathered to discuss what the meaning of matter is. What is reality? That was the title of their meeting, and it lasted like a couple of days mm. up to a week. And Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein were the protagonists of this scenario because they both had conflicting views as to what the inner circle of particles really meant. And Niels Bohr turned out to be correct. And he he presented this theory like, I can tell you this is the same photon in two different places at the same time. And when I move one, the other one moves it exactly the same way. I said, that's ridiculous. That can't possibly be right. Remember, we keep saying this, don't we? Trust science, don't trust scientists. Mm Mm-hmm. Albert Einstein had an impeccable reputation as a scientist. He had already won the Nobel Prize at this point. And he said, this is impossible. Lots of people believed him. Why should you believe him? He said, it's impossible. How do you know? Have you tested it? Have you gone into the laboratory? Have you done an experiment? No, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't believe it. That's like Jim Watson. A little bit. (laughs) He says, I don't believe it. What do you mean you don't believe it? Here's the math. Check it out. It's it's impeccable mathematics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's no other interpretation except this. So as something as bizarre as, as uh, obviously quantum mechanics, which, I, again, I don't pretend to even understand a little bit of it. I understand this part because I struggled with metabolic pathways all the way through graduate school. So I can understand how someone working in a lab all by themselves with a series of purified chemicals would take a long time coming up with this explanation. Whereas today, because we've got those genomes, we've got that data, we've got the ability to to mix them together. By the way, I must tell you, quantum computers will speed up the comparison 
part of this deal. Mm -hmm. They said we can compute in minutes what now takes weeks to compute using a quantum uh, computer. Qubits, I believe the units are called qubits rather than transistors. Or something. All right. So, so that's my philosophy entry into 2019. Mm-hmm. I'm astounded at how far the human condition has come and how much knowledge we have gained and how little we understand our world, given all that knowledge. Because every time we get a new approach to something, it trashes all the old stuff. And now we have to look at something else in a new, completely different way. And I'm just, I'm quelling over the fact that I know scientists, that I consider myself a scientist. It's a privilege to be in that position of being able to observe reality and giving it your best shot at interpreting what you're really looking at. And these guys are doing a, this is a very difficult subject right here to try to figure out what four different organisms are doing all at the same time. That's almost an impossible, like two body problem versus three body problem in physics. They have the reductionist approach, which is exactly start with one and you grow it and that's what we can do. Yeah. 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 Daniel, you like this paper? I, I do, actually. And I, I think, as everyone's sort of suggesting, I think this is a little bit of what's to come. Um, and, you know, and, and they start off, and I think they're pretty generous in the first sentence of their paper where they say, <laughs> yes. it has been estimated that only 1% or, of all microbial life is culturable. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's less. <laughs> it's less. Let's just be honest. It's, much, much. You know, less, 1% right. of what we think and know about. And, and it really challenges Koch's <laughs> postulates, right? You know? Yes, it so does. It, it, it changes everything. And and also what we're seeing about changing everything is this idea of we, we now can take all this different knowledge um, of metabolic pathways, of genetics, computer technology, and actually sit down there in in the, if you call it a lab, a, a dry lab, I mean, what, what <laughs> dry do you call it? Uh, basically sit there, with your, sit, there at, <laughs> sit there at your computer. I mean, and, you know, and, and actually some of the stuff gets so complicated. It's not sitting there at your laptop. It's sitting there at a pretty powerful computer that they've got uh, across the street in the That's oncology right. center because yeah. – my computers can't do this analysis, and no, no. Uh, and you you and a lot of actually this analysis of metabolic pathways is coming out of um, a lot of interest in can we can we take this knowledge and help us fight cancer, and then sure. by the way you know we're the red headed stepchildren over here in the world of parasitology can we use that too and better understand our parasites sure. And uh, so I, and then, you know, in all honesty, they do a little bit of wet science, but you're sort of like, at some point, as I think you suggested, Vincent, we're going to be like, we don't need to do that anymore because we're always <laughs> right, right? We'll <laughs> reach a certain point. Um, mm. But yeah, so I think that this, this is uh, a little bit of what's to come. And so it's a yeah. very interesting, um, I mean, very interesting. Paper. I don't know how many organisms have been, the genomes have been sequenced. You could probably look that up. There's a number that you could get, uh, maybe 20,000 or 30,000 different organisms already. But there are how many different organisms? There are perhaps 100,000. Perhaps mm-hmm. there's 100 million. We don't know how many. And E.O. Olson makes a big point of this in one of his books called Diversity of Life. It addresses the issue of how many species are there and what is a species and how do you define it and all this. So, you want to know how many different species have been sequenced? Yeah, I would because, love. You know, there are over know. half a million human genomes already. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But okay. It, it, how many does it show up on the computer? <laughs> does the computer know? Yeah. <laughs> Ask Doctor yeah, Google. I, I, I was also going to say, and you know, we're seeing here this um, called in silico analysis, where they're looking. Uh, this organism is saying, okay, now we want to grow this. What do we put it in? Um, the same type of technology is being applied to um, how can we grow cells? And I remember, yep. um, you guys all remember Michael, who uh, was involved with Dr. Goff in the uh, the contagious cancer sure. cells. That's right, from clams. It's from clams. And I remember Michael and I talking one time about, you know, the challenge was trying to grow these cells in culture. And exactly. this is a great um, technology that you can apply. Yep. You get the exome from the cell. You see what it can and can't make. You figure out what it what it would need to be able to grow. And so you go from sort of, hey, let's try 20 different, you know, insect media, 20 <laughs> different cells. Let's just actually do the science. And then it, it should hopefully generate um, a media that we can then use. And then maybe we do a little subtle changes. But uh, this is exciting stuff. So, 
Daniel, that's a great point to raise too, because I remember <laughs> in my youth, as they would say, the very first cell culture, mm -hmm. right? Which was used to grow, I believe, polio virus, and I'm, I'm mistaken. Mm. And they gave a Nobel Prize to the people who were able to do that, and they were Enders. Weller and Weller, Robbins. Robbins. And yeah. Weller was a parasitologist by training and became the uh, dean of the uh, School of Public Health at Harvard. I know his son pretty well, too, who also was a parasitologist. And how interesting is – now, that was the first cell culture that was definable, right? And you had Eagles Medium and Medium 199 and MEM and all kinds of other abbreviations. But today, these are these are designer media. I mean, you could design one per – like a rock-eating extremophile, <laughs> which mm. there are, by the mm. way. Um, it's crazy because the statement that only 1% has been culturable, well, they're all culturable if you know what they eat. <laughs> and the, the answer is how do you know what they eat here's how you know yeah it's impressive that's amazing Dixon you have a hero for now we have something completely different yes I do yes I do or, yeah a hero I have a hero I have a hero this is one of my personal heroes that I have um, lauded throughout my career as a parasitologist because of his connection to the worm that I used to work on in the lab called Trichinella spiralis and so how do we come to know about a worm called Trichinella spiralis that causes trichinosis? And here's part of the answer. This gentleman's name is James Paget. He's an MD, and indeed you might recognize his last name as um, the moniker on a disease which is named after him, Paget's disease, which, by the way, as I recall, he also suffered from, and that's exactly where the disease got its name because of him. He lived from 1814 to 1899, <clears throat> and he grew up in England, and he, he was a student at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in Medicine. And I'll just read what I've written. Paget observed the, pers the first parasitic worm infection of humans to be identified by microscopy. He did so while attending medical school at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. The parasite was Trichinella spiralis and was seen in a piece of muscle tissue obtained at autopsy from a 51-year-old bricklayer who had died of tuberculosis. Paget went on to become a famous pathologist. High among his other accomplishments, he described the pathological features of the bone disease that bears his name. And this seems a bit specialized and a bit, is, how can this possibly be a hero <clears throat> when it's such a narrowly focused um, discovery? Well, it turns out there's a subtext to all of this, and I highly recommend people going to the website called the Trichinella page, and on it there's a section in history, and there's a section on the discovery of Trichinella. And Paget wasn't the only person to observe this worm in the tissue of that cadaver that day. In fact, it turns out that the uh, the director of the British Museum of Natural History um James uh, uh, Owens, I'm sorry, Richard Owens, um, received a similar piece of tissue from the same cadaver uh, via another route. And since there were two microscopes at the British Museum of Natural History, both Paget and um, uh, Owens had the privilege of seeing the, the first parasitic infection caused by a nematode in the muscle tissue of a human. Um that led to a number of things that uh, that transpired after that. It, in, it, 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 in, it inspired a whole bunch of other people to go looking in similar tissues for other parasitic infections. And, you know, you open windows up when you do something for the first time, like Roger Bannister running the mile and in the four minutes. Uh, that, that was the first time that was ever done. You can now find people trying to break the three-minute mile, and they've done that. And then the next thing you know, they've got – well, how far down the, the, the minutes can you, can you reduce the speed uh, or increase the speed and reduce the mileage? At any rate, so that's, that's what this represents, one of those discoveries that by itself meant nothing. But uh, when you apply that to a lot of other things, uh, it just blew the, the window open. So he's a her hero of yours, huh? Yeah, very much so. Very good. Very much so. All right, that brings us to a new case. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, Daniel. boy. 
I, I was going to say that I don't think we've broken the three minute mile. I think three forty three is the current record. Three, but well, I'm, you're you're absolutely right on this. I, I've got my statistics a little bit off. Sorry about that. Were you were you a runner, Daniel? Uh, I I well, I like to think I still am. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually that when I when my running career ended i was training for the leadville 100 and uh which is a hundred mile race you know my goal was to finish it within 24 hours and i was doing a trail run with a buddy of mine and boy did i get hurt i was about Uh-oh. 15 miles in and i thought it was a shadow but it was actually a bit of uneven surface area and Eek. uh yeah. So now I now I run, you know, maybe three, four miles um, a few times a week, but much, much less than my former glory. But my my young my son is a runner. Nice. Um, but he is he's very fast. Right. Yeah. He's right. 13 years old. He's already running six minute miles nice. at 13, which is pretty good. It's but excellent. he doesn't quite get that it's a competitive sport. So he <laughs> finishes. Yeah. And he's not even short of breath. And I say, Barnaby, you realize it is a competitive <laughs> sport. And he just laughs. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> You run, Dixon? I ran the New York Marathon in 1985. That's right. Did that once. I'd never do it again. I'm now a walker, not a runner. <laughs> but I enjoyed the experience. It was quite mar- marvelous, actually. You're right. It's a four-minute mile, not a three-minute mile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So are we ready for a yep. new case? We're ready. Okay, Bring it now, on. Bring it on. Now, welcome to Uganda. We're going to do a we're gonna do a few cases here in Uganda. And uh, I think I described a little bit to uh, people that are regular listeners, but let, let's bring everybody up to speed. This is um, – it's a 36-hour door-to-door trip from New York. So I, I fly first from – first I got to get to the airport. Then I fly from uh, JFK to Amsterdam, from Amsterdam to Rwanda, from Rwanda to Entebbe, and then 10 hours by land. Now I'm in eastern Uganda. I'm in the border of Kenya, and I am in a FIMRIC, Foundation International Medical Relief of Children Clinic, uh, working with the staff, about a dozen people, seeing patients with a uh, with a nurse uh, who is able to speak the 15 different dialects. We're seeing over 100 patients a day. Wow. Um, we have limited, we have basically about nine things we can do as far as laboratory tests. And we've got to really, uh, make sure we see everyone cause we're not, you know, we're not going to go home and still have people sitting there in clinic cause some people come pretty far to be seen. So we could do malaria microscopy. We could do urinalysis. We could do pregnancy testing, syphilis testing. There actually is malaria rapid testing. We can do, uh, blood sugars. Uh, we could do TB and HIV testing, those are actually done for a, a hospital a few miles away, uh, but they can actually be done pretty quickly. And so we're going to have a, uh, a mother brings in her, her four-year-old child, and the mother is concerned. This is uh, the end of the rainy season, so we're just the rainy season's ending. We're about to get into the dry season. She's concerned that her four-year-old girl has one day of fever, headache, and a cough. Um, not much other in far symptoms. On exam, the girl looks ill, does not look like she's doing particularly well. Uh, she has unremarkable exam except for uh, rapid heart rate, and she has localized crackles in the right lower lung. Okay. So um, we're gonna we're gonna leave this broad, and we're gonna we're gonna say I just gave you a list of all the potential tests. What tests do you want to do? What are we worried about? And then based upon what you think we might be worried about, how are we gonna approach treatment in this this young girl? And why does the age of four? Why is that a sort of a important point in this case? Hmm. Right now, this is um, a child of a of a bigger family, or. Only child, or no? Several, several children in the family, and uh, this the the mother is just bringing in the one the one child who's sick. And the okay. others, and are, actually, the, so, others, the others, the are others fine. are the others are fine, and uh, and often they do come in with a couple children sick at the same time. And but, and how does a child spend her day? Uh, I actually. Um, I have a nice picture I'm looking at that I, I wrote this case up on, and there's a bunch of kids that are swimming in the local stream, and you know the parents tell them not to do that. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, they, you know, they, they run around. They help take care of the animals. I mean, the girl's only four, so she's not doing much work at this point. But mm-hmm. at a pretty young age, the kids start helping out, going out in the morning to gather the drinking water. And the, there's this idea. And uh, actually, uh, one of the nurses, uh, Godfrey, uh, I don't know what his his actual name is, or but Godfrey is what he went by. Uh, he was explaining to me that there's a belief among people that if you can get out early in the morning and get the water right away, it's still clean. <laughs> and then later right. in the day, <laughs> and and he said to me, you know, he told me, and then he said, but that's not true. <laughs> I was like, I agree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, yes, but they believe it's true. How far was so, your clinic from Lake Victoria? Uh, so I, I drove past Lake Victoria on the way, but we were probably. Hmm, Two hours, two or three hours. From well, that's right right, Victoria. Right, right, right. What what kind of abode do they inhabit? Uh, a lot of the homes are dirt floor um, right. homes. There, some of the wealthier people actually have concrete floor homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of animals, also. A lot, lot of animals around. A lot of uh, cows and right. chickens and uh, interesting turkeys. <laughs> um, What's the roof so, of the good. home? Is it like thatch? So a lot is a lot is thatch. A few of the wealthier people have either um, like a tin, or a few people have actually concrete type roofs. Right. Okay. A lot of wild animals in the area. Uh, there are a few snakes. Not a lot of snakes. Not a lot of large predatory animals. No primates. Uh, okay. uh, primates a little farther afield. Like you'd have to go up into the mountains, which you okay. could. All right. Uh, but not right there in the in the local area. Okay. And uh, a few homes had electricity. That was, again, sort of the, the wealthier, the top one percenters in the region. Right. Um, it, very few people had running water. Um, and none, none that I know of other than I think the hospital had some kind of a setup, sort of a modified where tanks were filled, and, but not, you know. How many mothers with little kids four years old showed up to your clinic during the time <laughs> you were there? Oh, lots. Uh, right. You know, that's as, what as I thought. Kid, this was a diagnosis <laughs> sure. that we made probably 30 times a day. Oh, so sure. yeah, exactly. picking a representative among the. Uh, <laughs> right. Wow. I don't have any more questions. Oh, Dixon knows. <laughs> he's he's there. Well, it does sound familiar. That's for sure. Okay, very good. But I could be wrong, maybe. I was wrong about this nasal septum case. Trust science, not science. <laughs> exactly. Does that go the same for doctors? Tr- trust medicine, not doctors? I hope so. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you trust your trust doctor. Trust me, I'm a doctor? If you, you don't trust your doctor, s- change. <laughs> yeah. You no. Don't. Well, Daniel knows that for sure because that's... No, you have to. I think you you have to put a certain trust in your doctor. You but, do, you do, you do, but, but not your scientist. No, you they have to convince science. you though that they're on your side and that they're trying their best to help you help yourself. Right. I want to just read two emails here, so we don't stay too late. Cool. Um, <clears throat> one is from Alexi, who writes, "Dear Twipsters, I enjoy listening to your podcast very much, along with the rest of the Microbe TV series. I'm sending you a link to a strange." Klezmer song, Life as a Parasite, that I've stumbled upon recently. Hope you like it. It is almost an illustration to some of your recent stories. Uh, Alexi is a PhD. And this this is, I I did watch this uh, some some time ago. (laughs) Did you, any of you look at it? It's pretty funny. No. Uh, Are we parasites of the earth? Is that what this is trying to say? I'm going to, I'm going to cue that up to watch right after we finish recording. Lynn Markle's. Definitely. No, no, that. no. It has nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a song by Daniel Kahn and the Painted Birds. But you listen to it. It's it's amusing. Very good. Yeah. Uh, and then Sarah writes, Pod Fessers. <laughs> As always, it's a delight to listen to you. I'm sad I've not been keeping up with the cases. I'll try my best in the future. I thought I'd jump on the recently discussed topic of heroes, heroines. I love that new interesting heroines have been sent in and will be included in your book and podcast, and I'm shamelessly going to plug one of my own efforts <laughs> to shine a light on women in science here, hoping for a twip bump. Me and the SciComm keen Science Girl Glasgow volunteer crew have started a new blog series called Science Girl. It's Science G-R-R-L of the moment, where we feature profiles, interviews of women out there doing some cool science on our blog and Twitter, we hope to inspire others to learn more about science and perhaps even pursue some equally cool careers. They might not be suitable for your hero segment. Mm-hmm. The first one we featured isn't even a parasitologist. Gasp! 
<laughs> but are for sure worthy hearing from and about nonetheless. Feel free to share with hosts and audiences on your other Twee series podcasts. So um, this is a blog called Science Girl Gra- Glasgow. All one word, but the girl is G-R-R-L dot wordpress dot com. We'll have a link in the show notes. Forever your faithful listener, Sarah from right now, New Zealand. Right. P.S. If this is read on Twiv, I love the weather segment. It <laughs> just contributes to the chill conversational atmosphere and is genuinely interesting. Just skip it if you don't like it or just suffer through. It's really not that long. It's currently 21C and very sunny here in Auckland. Sunscreen absolutely needed, but yikes, the weather <laughs> here is changeable. We have rain yes. rivaling Glasgow some days, and last week it hailed. Really spoiled our avocado picking. It helps helps with my Christmas feeling though. A sunny barbecue Christmas dinner just doesn't seem right when you're from Sweden. <laughs> All right. That's twip one six four. Please send your questions, comments, and guesses to twip at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, pleasure as always. Dixon Des Pommiers at trichinella.org, which wouldn't exist ex- unless James Paget had been around. There you go. <laughs> and the livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, I enjoyed this immensely. This was a great episode. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Twip is by Ronald Jenkins. Thanks to ASM for their support. Been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is is parasitic. parasitic.